The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 13. Zenobia's Legend. The illustrious society of Blythedale, though it toiled in downright earnest for the good of mankind, yet not unfrequently illuminated its laborious life with an afternoon or evening of pastime. Picnics under the trees were considerably in vogue, and, within doors, fragmentary bits of theatrical performance such as single acts of tragedy or comedy or dramatic proverbs and charades. Zenobia, besides, was fond of giving us readings from Shakespeare, and often with a depth of tragic power or breadth of comic effect that made one feel it an intolerable wrong to the world that she did not at once go upon the stage. Tableaux vivants were another of our occasional modes of amusement, in which scarlet shawls, old silken robes, ruffs, velvets, furs, and all kinds of miscellaneous trumpery converted our familiar companions into the people of a pictorial world. We had been thus engaged on the evening after the incident narrated in the last ch chapter. Several splendid works of art, either arranged after engravings from the old masters or original illustrations of scenes in history or romance, had been presented, and we were earnestly entreating Zenobia for more. She stood, with a meditative air, holding a large piece of gauze or some such ethereal stuff, as if considering what picture should next occupy the frame, while at her feet lay a heap of many-coloured garments which her quick fancy and magic skill could so easily convert into gorgeous draperies for heroes and princesses. "'I am getting weary of this,' said she, after a moment's thought. Our own features and our own figures and airs show a little too intrusively through all the characters we assume. We have so much familiarity with one another's realities that we cannot remove ourselves at pleasure into an imaginary sphere. Let us have no more pictures tonight, but to make you what poor amends I can, how would you like to have me trump up a wild spectral legend on the spur of the moment? Zenobia had the gift of telling a fanciful little story offhand in a way that made it greatly more effective than it was usually found to be when she afterwards elaborated the same production with her pen. Her proposal, therefore, was greeted with acclamation. "'Oh, a story, a story, by all means,' cried the young girls. "'No matter how marvelous, we will believe it, every word, and let it be a ghost story, if you please.' "'No, not exactly a ghost story,' answered Zenobia. "'but something so nearly like it "'that you shall hardly tell the difference. "'And, Priscilla, stand you before me "'where I may look at you "'and get my inspiration out of your eyes. "'They are very deep and dreamy tonight. "'I know not whether the following version "'of her story will retain any portion "'of its pristine character, "'but as Zenobia told it, "'wildly and rapidly, "'hesitating at no extravagance "'and dashing at absurdities "'which I am too timorous to repeat,' "'giving it the varied emphasis of her inimitable voice "'and the pictorial illustration of her mobile face, "'while, through it all, we caught the freshest aroma of the thoughts "'as they came bubbling out of her mind. "'Thus narrated, and thus heard, "'the legend seemed quite a remarkable affair. "'I scarcely knew at the time "'whether she intended us to laugh "'or be more seriously impressed. "'From the beginning to end, "'it was undeniable nonsense, "'but not necessarily... THE WORSE FOR THAT. THE SILVERY VEIL You have heard, my friends, of the veiled lady who grew suddenly so very famous a few months ago, and have you never thought how remarkable it was that this marvellous creature should vanish all at once, while her renown was on the increase before the public had grown weary of her, and when the enigma of her character, instead of being solved, presented itself more mystically at every exhibition? Her last appearance, as you know, was before a crowded audience. The next evening, although the bills had announced her at the corner of every street in red letters of a gigantic size, there was no veiled lady to be seen. Now, listen to my simple little tale, and you shall hear the very latest incident in the known life, if life it may be called, which seemed to have no more reality than the candlelight image of oneself which peeps at us, outside of a dark window-pane, the life of this shadowy phenomenon. A party of young gentlemen, you are to understand, were enjoying themselves one afternoon, as young gentlemen are sometimes fond of doing, over a bottle or two of champagne, and, among other ladies less mysterious, 
The subject of the veiled lady, as was very natural, happened to come up before them for discussion. She rose, as it were, with the sparkling effervescence of their wine, and appeared in a more airy and fantastic light on account of the medium through which they saw her. They repeated to one another between jest and earnest all the wild stories that were in vogue, nor, I presume, did they hesitate to add any small circumstance that the inventive whim of the moment might suggest to heighten the marvelousness of their theme. "'But what an audacious report was that,' observed one, which pretended to assert the identity of this strange creature with a young lady, and here he mentioned her name, the daughter of one of our most distinguished families.' "'Ah, there is more in that story than can well be accounted for,' remarked another. "'I have it on good authority that the young lady in question is invariably out of sight, "'and not to be traced even by her own family at the hours when the veiled lady is before the public. "'Nor can any satisfactory explanation be given of her disappearance. "'And just look at the thing. "'Her brother is a young fellow of spirit.' "'He cannot but be aware of these rumours in reference to his sister. "'Why, then, does he not come forward to defend her character, "'unless he is conscious that an investigation would only make the matter worse? "'It is essential to the purposes of my legend "'to distinguish one of these young gentlemen from his companions, "'so, for the sake of a soft and pretty name, "'such as we of the literary sisterhood invariably bestow upon our heroes, I deem it fit to call him Theodore. Pshaw! exclaimed Theodore. Her brother is no such fool. Nobody, unless his brain be as full of bubbles as this wine, can seriously think of crediting that ridiculous humor. Why, if my senses did not play me false, which never was the case yet, I affirm that I saw that very lady last evening at the exhibition while this veiled phenomenon was playing off her juggling tricks. What can you say to that? "'Oh, it was a spectral illusion that you saw,' replied his friends, with a general laugh. "'The veiled lady is quite up to such a thing. "'However, as the above-mentioned fable could not hold its ground against Theodore's downright refutation, "'they went on to speak of other stories, which the wild babble of the town had set afloat. "'Some upheld that the veil covered the most beautiful countenance in the world.' Others, and certainly with more reason, considering the sex of the veiled lady, that the face was the most hideous and horrible, and that this was her sole motive for hiding it. It was the face of a corpse. It was the head of a skeleton. It was a monstrous visage with snaky locks like medusas, and one great red eye in the center of the forehead. Again, it was affirmed that there was no single and unchangeable set of features beneath the veil, but that whosoever should be bold enough to lift it would behold the features of that person in all the world who was destined to be his fate. Perhaps he would be greeted by the tender smile of the woman whom he loved, or quite as probably the deadly scowl of his bitterest enemy would throw a blight over his life. They quoted moreover this startling explanation of the whole affair that the magician who exhibited the veiled lady, and who, by the by, was the handsomest man in the whole world, had bartered his own soul for seven years' possession of a familiar fiend, and that the last year of the contract was wearing towards its close. If it were worth our while, I could keep you till an hour beyond midnight listening to a thousand such absurdities as these, but finally... "'Our friend Theodore, who prided himself upon his common sense, "'found the matter getting quite beyond his patience. "'I offer any wager you like,' cried he, "'setting down his glass so forcibly as to break the stem of it, "'that this very evening I find out the mystery of the veiled lady.' "'Young men, I am told, boggle at nothing over their wine.' So after a little more talk, a wager of considerable amount was actually laid, the money staked, and Theodore left to choose his own method of settling the dispute. How he managed it I know not, nor is it of any great importance to this voracious legend. The most natural way, to be sure, was by bribing the doorkeeper, or possibly he preferred clambering in at the window. But at any rate, that very evening, while the exhibition was going forward in the hall, 
Theodore contrived to gain admittance into the private withdrawing room whither the veiled lady was accustomed to retire at the close of her performances. There he waited, listening, I suppose, to the stifled hum of the great audience, and no doubt he could distinguish the deep tones of the magician causing the wonders that he had brought to appear more dark and intricate by his mystic presence of an explanation. Perhaps, too, in the intervals of the wild, breezy music which accompanied the exhibition, he might hear the low voice of the veiled lady conveying her sibylline responses. Firm as Theodore's nerves might be, and much as he prided himself on his sturdy perception of realities, I should not be surprised if his heart throbbed at a little more than its ordinary rate. Theodore concealed himself behind a screen. In due time the performance was brought to a close, and whether the door was softly open, or whether her bodiless presence came through the wall, is more than I can say. But all at once, without the young man's knowledge how it happened, a veiled figure stood in the center of the room. It was one thing to be in presence of this mystery in the hall of exhibition where the warm, dense life of hundreds of other mortals kept up the beholder's courage and distributed her influence among so many. It was another thing to be quite alone with her, and that, too, with a hostile or at least an unauthorized and unjustifiable purpose. I rather imagine that Theodore now began to be sensible of something more serious in his enterprise than he had been quite aware of while he sat with his boon companions over their sparkling wine. Very strange, it must be confessed, was the movement with which the figure floated to and fro over the carpet with the silvery veil covering her from head to foot, so impalpable, so ethereal, so without substance as the texture seemed, yet hiding her every outline in an impenetrability like that of midnight. Surely she did not walk. She floated and flitted and hovered about the room, no sound of a footstep, no perceptible motion of a limb. It was as if a wandering breeze wafted her before it at its own wild and gentle pleasure. But by and by, a purpose began to be discernible throughout the seeming vagueness of her unrest. She was in quest of something. Could it be that a subtle presentiment had informed her of the young man's presence? And if so, did the veiled lady seek, or did she shun him? The doubt in Theodore's mind was speedily resolved, for after a moment or two of these erratic flutterings, she advanced more decidedly and stood motionless before the screen. "'Thou art here,' said a soft, low voice. "'Come forth, Theodore.' Thus, summoned by his name, Theodore, as a man of courage, had no choice. He emerged from his concealment and presented himself before the veiled lady with the wine flush, it may be, quite gone out of his cheeks. "'What wouldst thou with me?' she inquired, with the same gentle composure that was in her former utterance. "'Mysterious creature,' replied Theodore, "'I would know who and what you are.' "'My lips are forbidden to betray the secret,' said the veiled lady. "'At whatever risk I must discover it,' rejoined Theodore. "'Then,' said the mystery, "'there is no way save to lift my veil.' "'And Theodore, partly recovering his audacity, "'steps forward on the instant to do as the veiled lady had suggested. "'But she floated backward to the opposite side of the room,' as if the young man's breath had possessed power enough to waft her away. "'Pause one little instant,' said the soft, low voice, "'and learn the conditions of what thou art so bold to undertake. "'Thou canst go hence and think of me no more, "'or, at thy option, thou canst lift this mysterious veil "'beneath which I am a sad and lonely prisoner, "'in a bondage which is worse to me than death.' But before raising it, I entreat thee, in all maiden modesty, to bend forward and impress a kiss where my breath stirs the veil and my virgin lips shall come forward to meet thy lips, 
and from that instant, Theodore, thou shalt be mine, and I thine, with never more avail between us, and all the felicity of earth and of the future world shall be thine and mine together. So much may a maiden say behind the veil, If thou shrinkest from this, there is yet another way. And what is that? asked Theodore. Dost thou hesitate, said the veiled lady, to pledge thyself to me by meeting these lips of mine while the veil yet hides my face? Has not thy heart recognized me? Dost thou come hither not in holy faith, nor with a pure and generous purpose, but in scornful skepticism and idle curiosity? Still, thou mayest lift the veil, but from that instant, Theodore, I am doomed to be thy evil fate, nor wilt thou ever taste another breath of happiness. There was a shade of inexpressible sadness in the utterance of these last words, but Theodore, whose natural tendency was towards skepticism, felt himself almost injured and insulted by the veiled lady's proposal that he should pledge himself for life and eternity to so questionable a creature as herself, or even that she should suggest an inconsequential kiss, taking into view the probability that her face was none of the most bewitching. A delightful idea, truly, that he should salute the lips of a dead girl, or the jaws of a skeleton, or the grinning cavity of a monster's mouth. Even should she prove a comely maiden enough in other respects, the odds were ten to one that her teeth were defective, a terrible drawback on the delectableness of a kiss. "'Excuse me, fair lady,' said Theodore, and I think he nearly burst into a laugh, if I prefer to lift the veil first, and for this affair of the kiss we may decide upon it afterwards.' "'Thou hast made thy choice,' said the sweet, sad voice behind the veil, "'and there seemed a tender but unresentful sense of wrong "'done to womanhood by the young man's contemptuous interpretation of her offer. "'I must not counsel thee to pause, "'although thy fate is still in thine own hand.' "'Grasping at the veil, he flung it upward "'and caught a glimpse of a pale, lovely face beneath just one momentary glimpse, and then the apparition vanished, and the silvery veil fluttered slowly down and lay upon the floor. Theodore was alone. Our legend leaves him there. His retribution was to pine forever and ever for another sight of that dim, mournful face, which might have been his lifelong household, fireside joy to desire and waste life in a feverish quest, and never meet it more. But what, in good sooth, had become of the veiled lady? Had all her existence been comprehended within that mysterious veil, and was she now annihilated? Or was she a spirit with a heavenly essence, but which might have been tamed down to human bliss? Had Theodore been brave and true enough to claim her? Hearken, my sweet friends, and hearken, dear Priscilla, "'and you shall learn the little more that Zenobia can tell you. "'Just at the moment, so far as can be ascertained, "'when the veiled lady vanished, a maiden, pale and shadowy, "'rose up amid a knot of visionary people "'who were seeking for the better life. "'She was so gentle and so sad, "'a nameless melancholy gave her such hold upon their sympathies "'that they never thought of questioning whence she came. "'She might have heretofore existed or... Her thin substance might have been moulded out of air at the very instant when they first beheld her. It was all one to them. They took her to their hearts. Among them was a lady to whom more than to all the rest this pale, mysterious girl attached herself. But one morning the lady was wandering in the woods, and there met her a figure in an oriental robe with a dark beard and holding in his hand a silvery veil. He motioned her to stay. Being a woman of some nerve, she did not shriek nor run away, nor faint as many ladies would have been apt to do, but stood quietly and bade him speak. The truth was, she had seen his face before, but had never feared it, although she knew him to be a terrible magician. "'Lady,' said he, with a warning gesture, "'you are in peril.' "'Peril?' she exclaimed. "'And of what nature?' "'There is a certain maiden, 
replied the magician, who has come out of the realm of mystery and made herself your most intimate companion. Now the fates have so ordained it that, whether by her own will or no, this stranger is your deadliest enemy. In love, in worldly fortune, in all your pursuit of happiness, she is doomed to fling a blight over your prospects. There is but one possibility of thwarting her disastrous influence. Then tell me that one method, said the lady. Take this veil, he answered, holding forth the silvery texture. It is a spell. It is a powerful enchantment which I wrought for her sake and beneath which she was once my prisoner. Throw it at unawares over the head of the secret foe, stamp your foot and cry, Arise, magician, here is the veiled lady, and immediately I will rise up through the earth and seize her, and from that moment you are safe. So the lady took the silvery veil, which was like woven air, or like some substance airier than nothing, and that would float upward and be lost among the clouds where she wants to let it go. Returning homeward, she found the shadowy girl amid the knot of visionary transcendentalists who were still seeking for the better life. She was joyous now, and had a rose bloom in her cheeks, and was one of the prettiest creatures, and seemed one of the happiest that the world could show. But the lady stole noiselessly behind her and threw the veil over her head. As the slight ethereal texture sank inevitably down over her figure, the poor girl strove to raise it and met her dear friend's eyes with one glance of mortal terror and deep, deep reproach. It could not change her purpose. Arise, magician, she exclaimed, stamping her foot upon the earth. Here is the veiled lady. At the word uprose the bearded man in the oriental robes, the beautiful, the dark magician who had bartered away his soul. He threw his arms around the veiled lady, and she was his bond slave forevermore. Zenobia, all this while, had been holding this piece of gauze, and so managed it as greatly to increase the dramatic effect of the legend, at these points where the magic veil was to be described. Arriving at the catastrophe and uttering the fatal words, she flung the gauze over Priscilla's head, and for an instant her auditors held their breath, half expecting, I verily believe, that the magician would start up through the floor and carry off our poor little friend before our eyes. As for Priscilla, she stood droopingly in the midst of us, making no attempt to remove the veil. "'How do you find yourself, my love?' said Zenobia, lifting a corner of the gauze and peeping beneath it with a mischievous smile. Ah, the dear little soul. Why, she is really going to faint. Uh, Mr. Coverdale, Mr. Coverdale, pray bring a glass of water. Her nerves being none of the strongest, Priscilla hardly recovered her equanimity during the rest of the evening. This, to be sure, was a great pity, but nevertheless... We thought it a very bright idea of Zenobia's to bring her legend to so effective a conclusion. The end of chapter 13. Read by Rick Kistler.